Cleopatra 7 Philippator, Ancient Greek, Kappa Lambda Epsilon Omicron Pi Tau Rho Phi Iota Lambda Omicron Pi Tau Omega Rho, Romanized, Cleopatra Philippator, 69-10 or August 12, 30th BC, was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, nominally survived as pharaoh by her son Caesar Ion. As a member of the Ptolemaic dynasty, she was a descendant of its founder Ptolemy Isoner, a Macedonian Greek general and companion of Alexander the Great. After the death of Cleopatra, Egypt became a province of the Roman Empire, marking the end of the Hellenistic period that had lasted since the reign of Alexander, 336-323 BC. While her native language was Koine Greek, she was the first Ptolemaic ruler to learn the Egyptian language. In 58 BC, Cleopatra presumably accompanied her father Ptolemy XII during his exile to Rome, after a revolt in Egypt allowed his eldest daughter Berenice IV to claim the throne. The latter was killed in 55 BC when Ptolemy XII returned to Egypt with Roman military assistance. When Ptolemy XII died in 51 BC, he was succeeded by Cleopatra and her younger brother Ptolemy XIII as joint rulers, but a falling out between them led to open civil war. After losing the 48 BC Battle of Pharsalus in Greece against his rival Julius Caesar and Caesar's civil war, the Roman statesman Pompey fled to Egypt, a Roman client state. Ptolemy XIII had Pompey killed while Caesar occupied Alexandria in pursuit of Pompey. Caesar, a consul of the Roman Republic, attempted to reconcile Ptolemy XIII with Cleopatra. Ptolemy XIII's chief advisor Pothinos viewed Caesar's terms as favoring Cleopatra, and so his forces, which eventually fell under the control of Cleopatra's younger sister, Arsino IV, besieged Caesar and Cleopatra at the palace. The siege was lifted by reinforcements in early 47 BC and Ptolemy XIII died shortly thereafter in the Battle of the Nile. Arsino IV was exiled to Ephesus, and Caesar, now an elected dictator, declared Cleopatra and her younger brother Ptolemy XIV as joint rulers of Egypt. However, Caesar maintained a private affair with Cleopatra that produced a son, Caesar Ion, Ptolemy XV. Cleopatra traveled to Rome as a client queen in 46 and 44 BC staying at Caesar's villa. When Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC, Cleopatra attempted to have Caesar Ion named as his heir, but this fell instead to Caesar's grandnephew Octavian, known as Augustus by 27 BC, when he became the first Roman emperor. Cleopatra then had Ptolemy XIV killed and elevated Caesar Ion as co-ruler. In the Liberator Civil War of 43-42 BC, Cleopatra sided with the Roman Second Triumvirate formed by Octavian, Mark Antony, and Marcus Aemilius Lepinus. After their meeting at Tarsos in 41 BC, Cleopatra had an affair with Antony that would eventually produce three children, Alexander Helios, Cleopatra Selene II, and Ptolemy Philadelphus. Antony used his authority as a triumvir to carry out the execution of Arsino IV at Cleopatra's request. He became increasingly reliant on Cleopatra for both funding and military aid during his invasions of the Parthian Empire and Kingdom of Armenia. In the donations of Alexandria, Cleopatra's children with Antony were declared rulers over various erstwhile territories under Antony's authority. This event, along with his marriage to Cleopatra and divorce of Octavian's sister Octavia Minor, led to the final war of the Roman Republic. After engaging in a war of propaganda, Octavian forced Antony's allies in the Roman Senate to flee Rome in 32 BC and declared war on Cleopatra. The naval fleet of Antony and Cleopatra was defeated at the 31 BC Battle of Actium by Octavian's general Agrippa. Octavian's forces invaded Egypt in 30 BC and defeated those of Antony, leading to his suicide. When Cleopatra learned that Octavian planned to bring her to Rome for his triumphal procession, she committed suicide by poisoning, with the popular belief being that she was bitten by an ASP. Cleopatra's legacy survives in numerous works of art, both ancient and modern. Roman historiography and Latin poetry produced a generally polemic and negative view of the queen that pervaded later medieval and Renaissance literature. In the visual arts, ancient depictions of Cleopatra include Roman and Ptolemaic coinage, statues, busts, reliefs, cameo glass, cameo carvings, and paintings. She was the subject of many works in Renaissance and Baroque art, which included sculptures, paintings, poetry, Theatrical dramas such as William Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, 1608, and operas such as George Frederick Handel's Giulio Cesare Inigado, 1724. In modern times Cleopatra has appeared in both the applied and fine arts, burlesque satire, Hollywood films such as Cleopatra, 1963, and brand images for commercial products, 
becoming a pop culture icon of Egyptomania since the Victorian era. The Latinized form Cleopatra comes from the ancient Greek Cleopatra, Capilanda Epsilon Omicron Pitaro, meaning glory of her father, from Capilanda Omicron, Cleos, glory, and Pitaro, Pater, father. The masculine form would have been written either as Cleopatros, Capilanda Epsilon Pitaro Omicron, or Patroclos, Pitaro Omicron Capilanda Omicron. Cleopatra was the name of Alexander the Great's sister, as well as Cleopatra Alcyone, wife of Meliger in Greek mythology. Through the marriage of Ptolemy of the Epiphanes and Cleopatra Isaira, a Seleucid princess, the name entered the Ptolemaic dynasty. Cleopatra's adopted title Theophilipatera, Theta Epsilon Phi Iota Lambda Omicron Pi Tau Omega Rho Alpha, means God is who loves her father. Ptolemaic pharaohs were crowned by the Egyptian high priest of Todd at Memphis but resided in the multicultural and largely Greek city of Alexandria, established by Alexander the Great of Macedon. They spoke Greek and governed Egypt as Hellenistic Greek monarchs, refusing to learn the native Egyptian language. In contrast, Cleopatra could speak multiple languages by adulthood and was the first Ptolemaic ruler to learn the Egyptian language. She also spoke Ethiopian, Trogodite, Hebrew, or Aramaic, Arabic, the Syrian language, perhaps Syriac, Median, Parthian, and Latin, although her Roman contemporaries would have preferred to speak with her in her native Koine Greek. Aside from Greek, Egyptian, and Latin, these languages reflected Cleopatra's desire to restore North African and West Asian territories that once belonged to the Ptolemaic Kingdom. Roman interventionism in Egypt predated the reign of Cleopatra. When Ptolemy IX Lathyros died in late 81 BC, he was succeeded by his daughter Berenice III. However, with opposition building at the royal court against the idea of a sole reigning female monarch, Berenice III accepted joint rule in marriage with her cousin and stepson Ptolemy XI Alexander II, an arrangement made by the Roman dictator Sulla. Ptolemy XI had his wife killed shortly after their marriage in 80 BC, but was lynched soon thereafter in the resulting riot over the assassination. Ptolemy XI, and perhaps his uncle Ptolemy IX or father Ptolemy X Alexander I, willed the Ptolemaic kingdom to Rome as collateral for loans so that the Romans had legal grounds to take over Egypt, their client state, after the assassination of Ptolemy XI. The Romans chose instead to divide the Ptolemaic realm among the illegitimate sons of Ptolemy IX, bestowing Cyprus to Ptolemy of Cyprus and Egypt to Ptolemy XII Olites. Cleopatra VII was born in early 69 BC to the ruling Ptolemaic pharaoh Ptolemy XII and an unknown mother, presumably Ptolemy XII's wife Cleopatra VI Trifina, also known as Cleopatra V Trifina the mother of Cleopatra's older sister, Berenice IV Epiphania. Cleopatra Trifina disappears from official records a few months after the birth of Cleopatra in 69 BC. The three younger children of Ptolemy XII, Cleopatra's sister Arsino IV and brothers Ptolemy XIII Theos Philippator and Ptolemy XIV, were born in the absence of his wife. Cleopatra's childhood tutor was Philostratos, from whom she learned the Greek arts of oration and philosophy. During her youth Cleopatra presumably studied at the museum, including the Library of Alexandria. In 65 BC the Roman censor Marcus Licinius Crassus argued before the Roman Senate that Rome should annex Ptolemaic Egypt, but his proposed bill and the similar bill of tribute and Servilius Rullus in 63 BC were rejected. Ptolemy XII responded to the threat of possible annexation by offering remuneration and lavish gifts to powerful Roman statesmen such as Pompey during his campaign against Mithridates VI of Pontus, and eventually Julius Caesar after he became Roman consul in 59 BC. However, Ptolemy XII's profligate behavior bankrupted him and he was forced to acquire loans from the Roman banker Gaius Rabirius Postumus. In 58 BC the Romans annexed Cyprus and on accusations of piracy drove Ptolemy of Cyprus, Ptolemy XII's brother, to commit suicide instead of enduring exile to Paphos. Ptolemy XII remained publicly silent on the death of his brother, a decision which, along with ceding traditional Ptolemaic territory to the Romans, damaged his credibility among subjects already enraged by his economic policies. Ptolemy XII was then exiled from Egypt by force, traveling first to Rhodes, then Athens, and finally the villa of Triumvir Pompey in the Alban Hills, near Prenest, Italy. Ptolemy XII spent nearly a year there on the outskirts of Rome, ostensibly accompanied by his daughter Cleopatra then about 11. Berenice IV sent an embassy to Rome to advocate for her rule and oppose the reinstatement of her father Ptolemy XII, but Ptolemy had assassins kill the leaders of the embassy, an incident that was covered up by his powerful Roman supporters. 
when the Roman Senate denied Ptolemy XII the offer of an armed escort and provisions for a return to Egypt, he decided to leave Rome in late 57 BC and reside at the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. The Roman financiers of Ptolemy XII remained determined to restore him to power. Pompey persuaded Alex Gabinius, the Roman governor of Syria, to invade Egypt and restore Ptolemy XII, offering him 10,000 talents for the proposed mission. Although it put him at odds with Roman law, Gabinius invaded Egypt in the spring of 55 BC by way of Hasmone in Judea, where Hyrcanus II had Antipater the Idumean, father of Herod the Great, furnished the Roman-led army with supplies. As a young cavalry officer, Mark Antony was under Gabinius's command. He distinguished himself by preventing Ptolemy XII from massacring the inhabitants of Pelusion and for rescuing the body of Archelios, the husband of Berenice IV, after he was killed in battle, ensuring him a proper royal burial. Cleopatra, now 14 years of age, would have traveled with the Roman expedition into Egypt. Years later, Antony would profess that he had fallen in love with her at this time. Gabinius was put on trial in Rome for abusing his authority, for which he was acquitted, but his second trial for accepting bribes led to his exile, from which he was recalled seven years later in 48 BC by Caesar. Crassus replaced him as governor of Syria and extended his provincial command to Egypt, but he was killed by the Parthians at the Battle of Cary in 53 BC. Ptolemy XII had Berenice IV and her wealthy supporters executed, seizing their properties. He allowed Gabinius's largely Germanic and Gallic Roman garrison, the Gabiniani, to harass people in the streets of Alexandria and installed his longtime Roman financier Rabirius as his chief financial officer. Within a year, Rabirius was placed under protective custody and sent back to Rome after his life was endangered for draining Egypt of its resources. Despite these problems, Ptolemy XII created a will designating Cleopatra and Ptolemy XIII as his joint heirs, oversaw major construction projects such as the Temple of Edfu and a temple at Dendera, and stabilized the economy. On May 31, 52 BC, Cleopatra was made a regent of Ptolemy XII as indicated by an inscription in the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. Rabirius was unable to collect the entirety of Ptolemy XII's debt by the time of the latter's death, and so it was passed on to his successors Cleopatra and Ptolemy XIII. Ptolemy XII died sometime before March 22, 51 BC, when Cleopatra, in her first act as queen, began her voyage to Hermonthus, near Thebes, to install a new sacred Bucci's bull, worshipped as an intermediary for the god Montu in the ancient Egyptian religion. Cleopatra faced several pressing issues and emergencies shortly after taking the throne. These included famine caused by drought and a low level of the annual flooding of the Nile, and lawless behavior instigated by the Gabiniani, the now unemployed and assimilated Roman soldiers left by Gabinius to garrison Egypt. Inheriting her father's debts, Cleopatra also owed the Roman Republic 17.5 million drachmas. In 50 BC, Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, proconsul of Syria, sent his two eldest sons to Egypt most likely to negotiate with the Gabiniani and recruit them as soldiers in the desperate defense of Syria against the Parthians. However, the Gabiniani tortured and murdered these two, perhaps with secret encouragement by rogue senior administrators in Cleopatra's court. Cleopatra sent the Gabiniani culprits to Bibulus as prisoners awaiting his judgment, but he sent them back to Cleopatra and chastised her for interfering in their adjudication, which was the prerogative of the Roman Senate. Bibulus, Siding with Pompey and Caesar's civil war, failed to prevent Caesar from landing a naval fleet in Greece, which ultimately allowed Caesar to reach Egypt in pursuit of Pompey. By August 29, 51 BC, official documents started listing Cleopatra as the sole ruler, evidence that she had rejected her brother Ptolemy XIII as a co ruler. She had probably married him, but there is no record of this. The Ptolemaic practice of sibling marriage was introduced by Ptolemy II and his sister Arsino II. A long-held royal Egyptian practice, it was loathed by contemporary Greeks. By the reign of Cleopatra, however, it was considered a normal arrangement for Ptolemaic rulers. Despite Cleopatra's rejection of him, Ptolemy XIII still retained powerful allies, notably the eunuch Pothinos, his childhood tutor, regent, and administrator of his properties. Others involved in the cabal against Cleopatra included Achilles, a prominent military commander, and Theodotus of Chios, another tutor of Ptolemy XIII. Cleopatra seems to have attempted a short-lived alliance with her brother Ptolemy XIV, but by the autumn of 50 BC Ptolemy XIII had the upper hand in their conflict and began signing documents with his name before that of his sister, followed by the establishment of his first regnal date in 49 BC. 
In the summer of 49 BC, Cleopatra and her forces were still fighting against Ptolemy XIII within Alexandria when Pompey's son Nius Pompeius arrived, seeking military aid on behalf of his father. After returning to Italy from the wars in Gaul and crossing the Rubicon in January of 49 BC, Caesar had forced Pompey and his supporters to flee to Greece. In perhaps their last joint decree, both Cleopatra and Ptolemy XIII agreed to Nius Pompeius's request and sent his father 60 ships and 500 troops including the Gavignani, a move that helped erase some of the dead owed to Rome. Losing the fight against her brother, Cleopatra was then forced to flee to Alexandria and withdraw to the region of Thebes. By the spring of 48 BC Cleopatra had traveled to Rome and Syria with her younger sister, Arsino IV, to gather an invasion force that would head to Egypt. She returned with an army, but her advance to Alexandria was blocked by her brother's forces, including some Gavignani mobilized to fight against her. So she camped outside Pelusion in the eastern Nile Delta. In Greece, Caesar and Pompey's forces engaged each other at the decisive Battle of Pharsalus on August 9, 48 BC, leading to the destruction of most of Pompey's army and his forced flight to Tyre, Lebanon. Given his close relationship with the Ptolemies, Pompey ultimately decided that Egypt would be his place of refuge, where he could replenish his forces. Ptolemy XII's advisors, however, feared the idea of Pompey using Egypt as his base in a protracted Roman civil war. In a scheme devised by Theodotus, Pompey arrived by ship near Pelusion after being invited by a written message, only to be ambushed and stabbed to death on September 28, 48 BC. Ptolemy XIII believed he had demonstrated his power and simultaneously defused the situation by having Pompey's head, severed and impod, sent to Caesar, who arrived in Alexandria by early October and took up residence at the royal palace. Caesar expressed grief and outrage over the killing of Pompey and called on both Ptolemy XIII and Cleopatra to disband their forces and reconcile with each other. Octavian, Antony, and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus formed the Second Triumvirate in 43 BC, in which they were each elected for five-year terms to restore order in the Republic and bring Caesar's assassins to justice. Cleopatra received messages from both Gaius Cassius Longinus, one of Caesar's assassins, and Publius Cornelius Dolabella proconsul of Syria and Caesarian loyalist, requesting military aid. She decided to write Cassius an excuse that her kingdom faced too many internal problems, while sending the four legions left by Caesar in Egypt to Dalabella. However, these troops were captured by Cassius in Palestine. While Serapion, Cleopatra's governor of Cyprus, defected to Cassius and provided him with ships, Cleopatra took her own fleet to Greece to personally assist Octavian and Antony but her ships were heavily damaged in a Mediterranean storm and she arrived too late to aid in the fighting. By the autumn of 42 BC, Antony had defeated the forces of Caesar's assassins at the Battle of Philippi in Greece, leading to the suicide of Cassius and Brutus. By the end of 42 BC, Octavian had gained control over much of the western half of the Roman Republic and Antony the eastern half, with Lepidus largely marginalized. In the summer of 41 BC Antony established his headquarters at Tarsos in Anatolia and summoned Cleopatra there in several letters, which she rebuffed until Antony's envoy Quintus Delius convinced her to come. The meeting allowed Cleopatra to clear up the misconception that she had supported Cassius during the civil war and addressed territorial exchanges in the Levant, but Antony also undoubtedly desired to form a personal, romantic relationship with the queen. Cleopatra sailed up the Kidnos River to Tarsos and Thalamitos, hosting Antony and his officers for two nights of lavish banquets on board the ship. Cleopatra managed to clear her name as a supposed supporter of Cassius, arguing she had really attempted to help Dalabella in Syria, and convinced Antony to have her exiled sister, Arsino IV, executed at Ephesus. Cleopatra's former rebellious governor of Cyprus was also handed over to her for execution. As Antony prepared for another Parthian expedition in 35 BC, this time aimed at their ally Armenia, Octavia traveled to Athens with 2,000 troops and alleged support of Antony, but most likely in a scheme devised by Octavian to embarrass him for his military losses. Antony received these troops but told Octavian not to stray east of Athens as he and Cleopatra traveled together to Antioch, only to suddenly and inexplicably abandon the military campaign and head back to Alexandria. When Octavia returned to Rome Octavian portrayed his sister as a victim wronged by Antony, although she refused to leave Antony's household. Octavian's confidence grew as he eliminated his rivals in the West, including Sextus Pompeius and even Lepidus, the third member of the Triumvirate, 
who was placed under house arrest after revolting against Octavian in Sicily. Delius was sent as Antony's envoy to Artavastes II in 34 BC to negotiate a potential marriage alliance that would wed the Armenian king's daughter to Alexander Helios, the son of Antony and Cleopatra. When this was declined, Antony marched his army into Armenia, defeated their forces and captured the king and Armenian royal family. Antony then held a military parade in Alexandria as an imitation of a Roman triumph, dressed as Dionysus and riding into the city on a chariot to present the royal prisoners to Cleopatra, who was seated on a golden throne above a silver dais. News of this event was heavily criticized in Rome as a perversion of time-honored Roman rites and rituals to be enjoyed instead by an Egyptian queen. In an event held at the gymnasium soon after the triumph, Cleopatra dressed as Isis and declared that she was the queen of kings with her son Caesar Ion, king of kings, while Alexander Helios was declared king of Armenia, Media, and Parthia, and two-year-old Ptolemy Philadelphos was declared king of Syria and Cilicia. Cleopatra Selene II was bestowed with Crete and Cyrene. Antony and Cleopatra may have been wed during this ceremony. Antony sent a report to Rome requesting ratification of these territorial claims now known as the Donations of Alexandria. Octavian wanted to publicize it for propaganda purposes, but the two consuls, both supporters of Antony, had it censored from public view. In late 34 BC, Antony and Octavian engaged in a heated war of propaganda that would last for years. Antony claimed that his rival had illegally deposed Lepidus from their triumvirate and barred him from raising troops in Italy, while Octavian accused Antony of unlawfully detaining the king of Armenia. Marrying Cleopatra despite still being married to his sister Octavia, and wrongfully claiming Caesar Ion as the heir of Caesar instead of Octavian. The litany of accusations and gossip associated with this propaganda war have shaped the popular perceptions about Cleopatra from Augustan period literature through to various media in modern times. Cleopatra was said to have brainwashed Mark Antony with witchcraft and sorcery and was as dangerous as Homer's Helen of Troy in destroying civilization. Horace's satires preserved an account that Cleopatra once dissolved a pearl worth 2.5 million drachmas in vinegar just to win a dinner party bet. The accusation that Antony had stolen books from the Library of Pergamon to restock the Library of Alexandria later turned out to be an admitted fabrication by Gaius Calvisius Sabinus. A papyrus document dated to February 33 BC, later used to wrap a mummy, contains the signature of Cleopatra, probably written by an official authorized to sign for her. It concerns certain tax exemptions in Egypt granted to either Quintus Cecilius or Publius Canidius Crassus, a former Roman consul of Antony's confidant who would command his land forces at Actium. A subscript in a different handwriting at the bottom of the papyrus reads Make it happen or so be it, ancient Greek, Gamma Hyota Nu Sigma Theta Omega Hyota, Romanized, Genestnoi. This is likely the autograph of the queen, as it was Ptolemaic practice to countersign documents to avoid forgery. In a speech to the Roman Senate on the first day of his consulship on January 1, 33 BC, Octavian accused Antony of attempting to subvert Roman freedoms and territorial integrity as a slave to his oriental queen. Before Antony and Octavian's joint imperium expired on December 31, 33 BC, Antony declared Caesar Ion as the true heir of Caesar in an attempt to undermine Octavian. On January 1, 32 BC the Antonian loyalists Gaius Sosius and Nius Domitius Aehino Barbus were elected as consuls. On February 1, 32 BC, Sosius gave a fiery speech condemning Octavian, now a private citizen without public office, and introduced pieces of legislation against him. During the next senatorial session, Octavian entered the Senate House with armed guards and levied his own accusations against the consuls. Intimidated by this act, the consuls and over 200 senators still in support of Antony fled Rome the next day to join the side of Antony. Antony and Cleopatra traveled together to Ephesus in 32 BC where she provided him with 200 of the 800 naval ships he was able to acquire. Aehino Barbus, wary of having Octavian's propaganda confirmed to the public, attempted to persuade Antony to have Cleopatra excluded from the campaign against Octavian. Publius Canidius Crassus made the counter-argument that Cleopatra was funding the war effort and was a competent monarch. Cleopatra refused Antony's requests that she return to Egypt, judging that by blocking Octavian in Greece she could more easily defend Egypt. Cleopatra's insistence that she be involved in the battle for Greece led to the defections of prominent Romans, such as Aehino Barbus and Lucius Munatius Plancus. During the spring of 32 BC, Antony and Cleopatra traveled to Athens, where she persuaded Antony to send Octavia an official declaration of divorce. This encouraged Plancus to advise Octavian that he should seize Antony's will, invested with the Vestal Virgins. 
Although a violation of sacred and legal rights, Octavian forcefully acquired the document from the Temple of Vesta, and it became a useful tool in the propaganda war against Antony and Cleopatra. Octavian highlighted parts of the will, such as Caesar Ion being named heir to Caesar, that the donations of Alexandria were legal, that Antony should be buried alongside Cleopatra in Egypt instead of Rome, and that Alexandria would be made the new capital of the Roman Republic. In a show of loyalty to Rome, Octavian decided to begin construction of his own mausoleum at the Campus Martius. Octavian's legal standing was also improved by being elected consul in 31 BC. With Antony's will made public, Octavian had his case as belly, and Rome declared war on Cleopatra, not Antony. The legal argument for war was based less on Cleopatra's territorial acquisitions, with former Roman territories ruled by her children with Antony, and more on the fact that she was providing military support to a private citizen now that Antony's triumviral authority had expired. Antony and Cleopatra had a larger fleet than Octavian, but the crews of Antony and Cleopatra's navy were not all well trained, some of them perhaps from merchant vessels, whereas Octavian had a fully professional force. Antony wanted to cross the Adriatic Sea and blockade Octavian at either Tarentum or Brundisium, but Cleopatra, concerned primarily with defending Egypt, overrode the decision to attack Italy directly. Antony and Cleopatra set up their winter headquarters at Pat Ryan, Greece, and by the spring of 31 BC they had moved to Actium, on the southern side of the Ambracian Gulf. Cleopatra and Antony had the support of various allied kings, but Cleopatra had already been in conflict with Herod and an earthquake in Judea provided him with an excuse to be absent from the campaign. They also lost the support of Malachasite, which would prove to have strategic consequences. Antony and Cleopatra lost several skirmishes against Octavian around Actium during the summer of 31 BC, while defections to Octavian's camp continued, including Antony's longtime companion Delius and the allied kings Amentas of Galatia and Diotaros of Paphlagonia. While some in Antony's camp suggested abandoning the naval conflict to retreat inland, Cleopatra urged for a naval confrontation to keep Octavian's fleet away from Egypt. On September 2, 31 BC, the naval forces of Octavian, led by Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, met those of Antony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium. Cleopatra, aboard her flagship, the Antonius, commanded 60 ships at the mouth of the Ambracian Gulf, at the rear of the fleet in what was likely a move by Antony's officers to marginalize her during the battle. Antony had ordered that their ships should have sails on board for a better chance to pursue or flee from the enemy, which Cleopatra, ever concerned about defending Egypt, used to swiftly move through the area of major combat in a strategic withdrawal to the Peloponnese. Burstein writes that partisan Roman writers would later accuse Cleopatra of cowardly deserting Antony, but their original intention of keeping their sails on board may have been to break the blockade and salvage as much of their fleet as possible. Antony followed Cleopatra and boarded her ship, identified by its distinctive purple sails, as the two escaped the battle and headed for Tenaron. Antony reportedly avoided Cleopatra during this three-day voyage until her ladies-in-waiting at Tenaron urged him to speak with her. The Battle of Actium raged on without Cleopatra and Antony until the morning of September 3, and was followed by massive defections of officers, troops, and allied kings to Octavian's side. Following the tradition of Macedonian rulers, Cleopatra ruled Egypt and other territories such as Cyprus as an absolute monarch, serving as the sole lawgiver of her kingdom. She was the chief religious authority in her realm, presiding over religious ceremonies dedicated to the deities of both the Egyptian and Greek polytheistic faiths. She oversaw the construction of various temples to Egyptian and Greek gods, a synagogue for the Jews in Egypt, and even built the Caesarium of Alexandria, dedicated to the cult worship of her patron and lover Julius Caesar. Cleopatra was directly involved in the administrative affairs of her domain, tackling crises such as famine by ordering royal granaries to distribute food to the starving populace during a drought at the beginning of her reign. Although the command economy that she managed was more of an ideal than a reality, the government attempted to impose price controls, tariffs, and state monopolies for certain goods, fixed exchange rates for foreign currencies, and rigid laws forcing peasant farmers to stay in their villages during planting and harvesting seasons. Apparent financial troubles led Cleopatra to debase her coinage, which included silver and bronze currencies but no gold coins like those of some of her distant Ptolemaic predecessors. After her suicide, Cleopatra's three surviving children, Cleopatra Selene II, Alexander Helios, and Ptolemy Philadelphos, were sent to Rome with Octavian's sister Octavia the Younger, a former wife of their father, as their guardian. Cleopatra Selene II and Alexander Helios were present in the Roman triumph of Octavian in 29 BC. 
The fates of Alexander Helios and Ptolemy Philadelphus are unknown after this point. Octavia arranged the betrothal of Cleopatra Selene II to Juba II, son of Juba I, whose North African kingdom of Numidia had been turned into a Roman province in 46 BC by Julius Caesar due to Juba I's support of Pompey. The Emperor Augustus installed Juba II and Cleopatra Selene II, after their wedding in 25 BC, as the new rulers of Mauritania, where they transformed the old Carthaginian city of Iol into their new capital, renamed Caesarea Mauritaniae, modern Churchill, Algeria. Cleopatra Selene II imported many important scholars, artists, and advisors from her mother's royal court in Alexandria to serve her and Caesarea, now permeated in Hellenistic Greek culture. She also named her son Ptolemy of Mauritania, in honor of their Ptolemaic dynastic heritage. Cleopatra Selene II died around 5 BC, and when Juba II died in 23 24 AD, he was succeeded by his son Ptolemy. However, Ptolemy was eventually executed by the Roman Emperor Caligula in 40 AD perhaps under the pretense that Ptolemy had unlawfully minted his own royal coinage and utilized the regalia reserved for the Roman emperor. Ptolemy of Mauritania was the last known monarch of the Ptolemaic dynasty, although Queen Zenobia, of the short-lived Palmyrene Empire during the crisis of the 3rd century, would claim descent from Cleopatra. A cult dedicated to Cleopatra still existed as late as 373 AD when Petasanuath, an Egyptian scribe of the Book of Isis, explained that he overlaid the figure of Cleopatra with gold. Although almost 50 ancient works of Roman historiography mention Cleopatra, these often include only terse accounts of the Battle of Actium, her suicide, and Augustan propaganda about her personal deficiencies. Despite not being a biography of Cleopatra, the life of Antonius written by Plutarch in the 1st century AD provides the most thorough surviving account of Cleopatra's life. Plutarch lived a century after Cleopatra but relied on primary sources, such as Philotas of Amphissa, who had access to the Ptolemaic royal palace, Cleopatra's personal physician named Olympos, and Quintus Delius, a close confidant of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Plutarch's work included both the Augustan view of Cleopatra, which became canonical for his period, as well as sources outside of this tradition, such as eyewitness reports. The Jewish-Roman historian Josephus, writing in the first century AD, provides valuable information on the life of Cleopatra via her diplomatic relationship with Herod the Great, However, this work relies largely on Herod's memoirs and the biased account of Nicolaus of Damascus, the tutor of Cleopatra's children in Alexandria before he moved to Judea to serve as an advisor and chronicler at Herod's court. The Roman history published by the official and historian Cassius Dio in the early 3rd century AD, while failing to fully comprehend the complexities of the late Hellenistic world, nevertheless provides a continuous history of the era of Cleopatra's reign. Cleopatra is barely mentioned in Novello Alexandrino the memoirs of an unknown staff officer who served under Caesar. The writings of Cicero, who knew her personally, provide an unflattering portrait of Cleopatra. The Augustan period authors Virgil, Horace, Propertius, and Ovid perpetuated the negative views of Cleopatra approved by the ruling Roman regime, although Virgil established the idea of Cleopatra as a figure of romance and epic melodrama. Horace also viewed Cleopatra's suicide as a positive choice, an idea that found acceptance by the late Middle Ages with Geoffrey Chaucer. The historians Strabo, Valerius, Valerius Maximus, Pliny the Elder, and Appian, while not offering accounts as full as Plutarch, Josephus, or Dio, provided some details of her life that had not survived in other historical records. Inscriptions on contemporary Ptolemaic coinage and some Egyptian papyrus documents demonstrate Cleopatra's point of view, but this material is very limited in comparison to Roman literary works. The fragmentary Lebica commissioned by Cleopatra's son-in-law Juba II provides a glimpse at a possible body of historiographic material that supported Cleopatra's perspective. Cleopatra's gender has perhaps led to her depiction as a minor if not insignificant figure in ancient, medieval, and even modern historiography about ancient Egypt in the Greco-Roman world. For instance, the historian Ronald Syme asserted that she was of little importance to Caesar and that the propaganda of Octavian magnified her importance to an excessive degree. Although the common view of Cleopatra was one of a prolific seductress, she had only two known sexual partners, Caesar and Antony, the two most prominent Romans of the time period, who were most likely to ensure the survival of her dynasty. Plutarch described Cleopatra as having had a stronger personality and charming with than physical beauty. Cleopatra was depicted in various ancient works of art, in the Egyptian as well as Hellenistic Greek and Roman styles. Surviving works include statues, busts, reliefs, and minted coins, 
as well as ancient carved cameos, such as one depicting Cleopatra and Antony in Hellenistic style, now in the Altas Museum, Berlin. Contemporary images of Cleopatra were produced both in and outside of Ptolemaic Egypt. For instance, a large gilded bronze statue of Cleopatra once existed inside the Temple of Venus Genetrix in Rome, the first time that a living person had their statue placed next to that of a deity in a Roman temple. It was erected there by Caesar and remained in the temple at least until the 3rd century AD, its preservation perhaps owing to Caesar's patronage, although Augustus did not remove or destroy artworks in Alexandria depicting Cleopatra. In regards to surviving Roman statuary, a light sized Roman style statue of Cleopatra was found near the Tomba di Nerone. Rome, along the Via Cascia and is now housed in the Museo Pio Clementino, part of the Vatican Museums. Plutarch, in his Life of Antonius, claimed that the public statues of Antony were torn down by Augustus, but those of Cleopatra were preserved following her death thanks to her friend Archidius paying the emperor 2,000 talents to dissuade him from destroying theirs. Since the 1950s scholars have debated whether or not the Esquiline Venus, discovered in 1874 on the Esquiline Hill in Rome and housed in the Palazzo dei Conservatori of the Capitoline Museums, is a depiction of Cleopatra, based on the statue's hairstyle and facial features, apparent royal diadem worn over the head, and the Arias Egyptian cobra wrapped around the base. Detractors of this theory argue that the face in the statue is thinner than the face on the Berlin portrait and assert that it was unlikely she would be depicted as the naked goddess Venus, or the Greek Aphrodite. However, she was depicted in an Egyptian statue as the goddess Isis, while some of her coinage depicts her as Venus Aphrodite. She also dressed as Aphrodite when meeting Antony at Tarsos. The Esquiline Venus is generally thought to be a mid 1 st century AD Roman copy of a 1st century BC Greek original from the school of Pasiteles. Surviving coinage of Cleopatra's reign includes specimens from every regnal year, from 51 to 30 BC. Cleopatra the only Ptolemaic queen to issue coins on her own behalf, almost certainly inspired her partner Caesar to become the first living Roman to present his portrait on his own coins. Cleopatra was also the first foreign queen to have her image appear on Roman currency. Coins dated to the period of her marriage to Antony, which also bear his image, portray the queen as having a very similar aquiline nose and prominent chin as that of her husband. These similar facial features followed an artistic convention that represented the mutually observed harmony of a royal couple. Her strong, almost masculine facial features in these particular coins are strikingly different from the smoother, softer, and perhaps idealized sculpted images of her in either the Egyptian or Hellenistic styles. Her masculine facial features on minted currency are similar to that of her father, Ptolemy XII Olites, and perhaps also to those of her Ptolemaic ancestor Arsino II. 316 to 260 BC, and even depictions of earlier queens such as Hatshepsut and Nefertiti. It is likely, due to political expediency, that Antony's visage was made to conform not only to hers but also to those of her Macedonian Greek ancestors who founded the Ptolemaic dynasty, to familiarize himself to her subjects as a legitimate member of the royal house. The inscriptions on the coins are written in Greek, but also in the nominative case of Roman coins rather than the genitive case of Greek coins in addition to having the letters placed in a circular fashion along the edges of the coin instead of across it horizontally or vertically as was customary for Greek ones. These facets of their coinage represent the synthesis of Roman and Hellenistic culture, and perhaps also a statement to their subjects, however ambiguous to modern scholars, about the superiority of either Antony or Cleopatra over the other. Diana Kleiner argues that Cleopatra, in one of her coins minted with the dual image of her husband Antony, made herself more masculine-looking than other portraits and more like an acceptable Roman client queen than a Hellenistic ruler. Cleopatra had actually achieved this masculine look in coinage predating her affair with Antony, such as the coins struck at the Ashkelon Mint during her brief period of exile to Syria and the Levant, which Joanne Fletcher explains as her attempt to appear like her father and as a legitimate successor to a male Ptolemaic ruler. Various coins, such as a silver tetradrachm minted sometime after Cleopatra's marriage with Antony in 37 BC, depict her wearing a rail diadem and a melon hairstyle. The combination of this hairstyle with a diadem is also featured in two surviving sculpted marble heads. This hairstyle, with hair braided back into a bun, is the same as that worn by her Ptolemaic ancestors Arsino II and Berenice II in their own coinage. After her visit to Rome in 46-44 BC it became fashionable for Roman women to adopt it as one of their hairstyles, but it was abandoned for a more modest, austere look during the conservative rule of Augustus. Of the surviving Greco-Roman style busts and heads of Cleopatra, the sculpture known as the Berlin Cleopatra, 
located in the antique and Samlin Berlin collection at the Altus Museum, possesses her full nose, whereas the head known as the Vatican Cleopatra, located in the Vatican Museums, is damaged with a missing nose. Both the Berlin Cleopatra and Vatican Cleopatra have royal diadems, similar facial features, and perhaps once resembled the face of her bronze statue housed in the Temple of Venus Genetrix. Both heads are dated to the mid-1st century BC and were found in Roman villas along the Via Appia in Italy, the Vatican Cleopatra having been unearthed in the villa of the Quintilii. Francisco P. Napolo writes that Cleopatra's coinage present her image with certainty and asserts that the sculpted portrait of the Berlin head is confirmed as having a similar profile with her hair pulled back into a bun, a diadem, and a hooked nose. A third sculpted portrait of Cleopatra accepted by scholars as being authentic survives at the Archaeological Museum of Churchill, Algeria. This portrait features the royal diadem and similar facial features as the Berlin and Vatican heads, but has a more unique hairstyle and may actually depict Cleopatra Selene II, daughter of Cleopatra. A possible Parian marble sculpture of Cleopatra wearing a vulture headdress in Egyptian style is located at the Capitoline Museums. Discovered near a sanctuary of Isis in Rome and dated to the 1st century BC, it is either Roman or Hellenistic Egyptian in origin. Other possible sculpted depictions of Cleopatra include one in the British Museum, London, made of limestone, which perhaps only depicts a woman in her entourage during her trip to Rome. The woman in this portrait has facial features similar to others, including the pronounced aquiline nose, but lacks a royal diadem and sports a different hairstyle. However, the British Museum head once belonging to a full statue, could potentially represent Cleopatra at a different stage in her life and may also betray an effort by Cleopatra to discard the use of royal insignia, i.e. the diadem, to make herself more appealing to the citizens of Republican Rome. Dwayne W. Roller speculates that the British Museum head, along with those in the Egyptian Museum, Cairo, the Capitoline Museums, and in the private collection of Maurice Nauman, while having similar facial features and hairstyles as the Berlin portrait but lacking a royal diadem, most likely represent members of the royal court or even Roman women imitating Cleopatra's popular hairstyle. In the house of Marcus Fabius Rufus at Pompeii, Italy, a mid-1st century BC second-style wall painting of the goddess Venus holding a cupid near massive temple doors is most likely a depiction of Cleopatra's Venus genetrix with her son Caesar Ion. The commission of the painting most likely coincides with the erection of the temple of Venus genetrix in the Forum of Caesar in September 46 BC where Caesar had a gilded statue erected depicting Cleopatra. This statue likely formed the basis of her depictions in both sculpted art as well as this painting at Pompeii. The woman in the painting wears a royal diadem over her head and is strikingly similar in appearance to the Vatican Cleopatra, which pairs possible marks on the marble of its left cheek where Cupid's arm may have been torn off. The ruin with the painting was walled off by its owner, perhaps in reaction to the execution of Caesar Ion in 30 BC by order of Octavian when public depictions of Cleopatra's son would have been unfavorable with a new Roman regime. Behind her golden diadem, crowned with a red jewel, is a translucent veil with crinkles that suggest the melon hairstyle favored by the queen. Her ivory white skin, round face, long aquiline nose, and large round eyes were features common in both Roman and Ptolemaic depictions of deities. Roller affirms that there seems little doubt that this is a depiction of Cleopatra and Caesar Ion before the doors of the Temple of Venus in the Forum Julium and as such, it becomes the only extant contemporary painting of the queen. Another painting from Pompeii, dated to the early 1st century AD and located in the house of Giuseppe II, contains a possible depiction of Cleopatra with her son Caesar Ion, both wearing royal diadems while she reclines and consumes poison in an act of suicide. The painting was originally thought to depict the Carthaginian noblewoman Sophonisba, who toward the end of the Second Punic War, 218-201 BC, drank poison and committed suicide at the behest of her lover Mazinissa, king of Numidia. Arguments in favor of it depicting Cleopatra include the strong connection of her house with it of the Numidian royal family, Mazinissa and Ptolemy VIII Fiscon having been associates, and Cleopatra's own daughter marrying the Numidian prince Juba II. Sophonisba was also a more obscure figure when the painting was made, while Cleopatra's suicide was far more famous. An ASP is absent from the painting but many Romans held the view that she received poison in another manner than a venomous snake bite. A set of double doors on the rear wall of the painting, positioned very high above the people in it, suggests the described layout of Cleopatra's tomb in Alexandria. A male servant holds the mouth of an artificial Egyptian crocodile, possibly an elaborate tray handle, 
while another man standing by is dressed as a Roman. In 1818, an now lost encaustic painting was discovered in the Temple of Serapis at Hadrian's Villa, near Tivoli, Lazio, Italy, that depicted Cleopatra committing suicide with an ASP biting her bare chest. A chemical analysis performed in 1822 confirmed that the medium for the painting was composed of one third wax and two thirds resin. The thickness of the painting over Cleopatra's bare flesh and her drapery were reportedly similar to the paintings of the Fayum mummy portraits. A steel engraving published by John Sartain in 1885 depicting the painting as described in the archaeological report shows Cleopatra wearing authentic clothing and jewelry of Egypt in the late Hellenistic period, as well as the radiant crown of the Ptolemaic rulers, as seen in their portraits on various coins minted during their respective reigns. After Cleopatra's suicide, Octavian commissioned a painting to be made depicting her being bitten by a snake, parading this image in her stead during his triumphal procession in Rome. The portrait painting of Cleopatra's death was perhaps among the great number of artworks and treasures taken from Rome by Emperor Hadrian to decorate his private villa, where it was found in an Egyptian temple. A Roman panel painting from Herculaneum, Italy, dated to the 1st century AD, possibly depicts Cleopatra. In it, she wears a royal diadem, red or reddish brown hair pulled back into a bun, pearl studded hairpins, and earrings with ball shaped pendants, the white skin of her face and neck set against a stark black background. Her hair and facial features are similar to those in the sculpted Berlin and Vatican portraits as well as her coinage. A highly similar painted bust of a woman with a blue headband in the house of the orchard at Pompeii features Egyptian-style imagery, such as a Greek-style sphinx, and may have been created by the same artist. The Portland Vase, a Roman cameo glass vase dated to the Augustan period and now in the British Museum, includes a possible depiction of Cleopatra with Antony. In this interpretation, Cleopatra can be seen grasping Antony and drawing him toward her while a serpent, i.e. the ASP, rises between her legs, Eros floats above, and Anton, the alleged ancestor of the Antonian family, looks on in despair as his descendant Antony is led to his doom. The other side of the vase perhaps contains a scene of Octavia, abandoned by her husband Antony but watched over by her brother, the Emperor Augustus. The vase would thus have been created no earlier than 35 BC when Antony sent his wife Octavia back to Italy and stayed with Cleopatra in Alexandria. The bust of Cleopatra in the Royal Ontario Museum represents a bust of Cleopatra in the Egyptian style. Dated to the mid-first century BC, it is perhaps the earliest depiction of Cleopatra as both a goddess and ruling pharaoh of Egypt. The sculpture also has pronounced eyes that share similarities with Roman copies of Ptolemaic sculpted works of art. The Dendera Temple Complex, near Dendera, Egypt, Contains Egyptian style carved relief images along the exterior walls of the Temple of Hathor depicting Cleopatra and her young son Caesar Ion as a grown adult and ruling pharaoh making offerings to the gods. Augustus had his name inscribed there following the death of Cleopatra. A large Ptolemaic black basalt statue measuring 41 inches, 1.04 in, in height, now in the Hermitage Museum, St. Petersburg, is thought to represent Arsino II, wife of Ptolemy II but recent analysis has indicated that it could depict her descendant Cleopatra due to the three rei adorning her headdress, an increase from the two used by Arsino II to symbolize her rule over Lower and Upper Egypt. The woman in the basalt statue also holds a divided, double cornucopia, dicross, which can be seen on coins of both Arsino II and Cleopatra. In his Cleopatra and Di Caesarin, 2006, Bernard Andrea contends that this basalt statue, like other idealized Egyptian portraits of the queen, does not contain realistic facial features and hence adds little to the knowledge of her appearance. Adrian Goldsworthy writes that, despite these representations in the traditional Egyptian style, Cleopatra would have only dressed as a native perhaps for certain rites and instead would usually dress as a Greek monarch, which would include the Greek headband seen in her Greco-Roman busts. In modern times Cleopatra has become an icon of popular culture a reputation shaped by theatrical representations dating back to the Renaissance as well as paintings and films. This material largely surpasses the scope and size of existent historiographic literature about her from classical antiquity and has made a greater impact on the general public's view of Cleopatra than the latter. The 14th-century English poet Geoffrey Chaucer, in The Legend of Good Women, contextualized Cleopatra for the Christian world of the Middle Ages. His depiction of Cleopatra and Antony her shining knight engaged in courtly love, has been interpreted in modern times as being either playful or misogynistic satire. However, 
Chaucer highlighted Cleopatra's relationships with only two men as hardly the life of a seductress and wrote his works partly in reaction to the negative depiction of Cleopatra in Demuli Erebus Claris and Ducasibus Virora Melustrium, Latin works by the 14th century Italian poet Giovanni Boccaccio. The Renaissance humanist Bernardino Caccindi, in his 1504 libretto Apologetico del Don, was the first Italian to defend the reputation of Cleopatra and criticize the perceived moralizing and misogyny in Boccaccio's works. Works of Islamic historiography written in Arabic covered the reign of Cleopatra, such as the 10th century Meadows of Gold by Al Masudi, although his work erroneously claimed that Octavian died soon after Cleopatra's suicide. Cleopatra appeared in miniatures for illuminated manuscripts, such as a depiction of her and Antony lying in a Gothic style tomb by the Boussicot master in 1409. In the visual arts, the sculpted depiction of Cleopatra as a freestanding nude figure committing suicide began with the 16th century sculptors Bartolomeo Bandinelli and Alessandro Vittoria. Early prints depicting Cleopatra include designs by the Renaissance artists Raphael and Michelangelo, as well as 15th century woodcuts and illustrated editions of Boccaccio's works. In the performing arts, the death of Elizabeth I of England in 1603, and the German publication in 1606 of alleged letters of Cleopatra inspired Samuel Daniel to alter and republish his 1594 play Cleopatra in 1607. He was followed by William Shakespeare, whose Antony and Cleopatra, largely based on Plutarch, was first performed in 1608 and provided a somewhat salacious view of Cleopatra in stark contrast to England's own virgin queen. Cleopatra was also featured in operas, such as George Frederick Handel's 1724 Giulio Cesare and Egido, which portrayed the love affair of Caesar and Cleopatra. In Victorian Britain, Cleopatra was highly associated with many aspects of ancient Egyptian culture and her image was used to market various household products, including oil lamps, lithographs, postcards, and cigarettes. Fictional novels such as H. Ryder Heddard's Cleopatra, 1889, and Théophile Gautier's One of Cleopatra's Nights, 1838, depicted the queen as a sensual and mystic Easterner, while the Egyptologist George E. vs. Cleopatra, 1894, was more grounded in historical accuracy. The French dramatist Victorian Sardou and Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw produced plays about Cleopatra, while burlesque shows such as F.C. Burnin's Antony and Cleopatra offered satirical depictions of the queen connecting her and the environment she lived in with the modern age. Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra was considered canonical by the Victorian era. Its popularity led to the perception that the 1885 painting by Lawrence Almadadema depicted the meeting of Antony and Cleopatra on her pleasure barge in Tarsus, although Almadadema revealed in a private letter that it depicts a subsequent meeting of theirs in Alexandria. In his unfinished 1825 short story The Egyptian Knights, Alexander Pushkin popularized the claims of the 4th century Roman historian Aurelius Victor, previously largely ignored, that Cleopatra had prostituted herself to men who paid for sex with their lives. Cleopatra also became appreciated outside the Western world and Middle East, as the Qin dynasty Chinese scholar Yan Fu wrote an extensive biography of her. George Melies is robbing Cleopatra's tomb. French, Cleopater, an 1899 French silent horror film, was the first film to depict the character of Cleopatra. Hollywood films of the 20th century were influenced by earlier Victorian media, which helped to shape the character of Cleopatra played by Theta Bara in Cleopatra, 1917. Claudette Colbert in Cleopatra, 1934, and Elizabeth Taylor in Cleopatra, 1963. In addition to her portrayal as a vampire queen, Barra's Cleopatra also incorporated tropes familiar from 19th century Orientalist painting, such as despotic behavior, mixed with dangerous and overt female sexuality. Colbert's character of Cleopatra served as a glamour model for selling Egyptian themed products in department stores in the 1930s, targeting female moviegoers. In preparation for the film starring Taylor as Cleopatra, women's magazines of the early 1960s advertised how to use makeup, clothes, jewelry, and hairstyles to achieve the Egyptian look similar to the Queen's Cleopatra and Nefertiti. By the end of the 20th century there were 43 separate films, 200 plays and novels, 45 operas, and 5 ballets associated with Cleopatra. Whereas myths about Cleopatra persist in popular media, important aspects of her career go largely unnoticed, such as her command of naval forces, administrative acts, and publications on ancient Greek medicine. Only fragments exist of the medical and cosmetic writings attributed to Cleopatra, such as those preserved by Galen, including remedies for hair disease, baldness, and dandruff, along with a list of weights and measures for pharmacological purposes. 
Aetius of Amida attributed a recipe for perfumed soap to Cleopatra, while Paul of Aegina preserved alleged instructions of hers for dyeing and curling hair. The attribution of certain texts to Cleopatra, however, is doubted by Ingrid de Roland, who highlights that the Berenice called Cleopatra as cited by the 3 RD or 4th century female Roman physician Metrodora was likely conflated by medieval scholars as referring to Cleopatra. Cleopatra belonged to the Macedonian Greek dynasty of the Ptolemies, their European origins tracing back to northern Greece. Through her father, Ptolemy XII Olites, she was a descendant of two prominent companions of Alexander the Great of Macedon, the general Ptolemy Isoner, founder of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, and Seleucus I Nicator, the Macedonian Greek founder of the Seleucid Empire of West Asia. While Cleopatra's paternal line can be traced through her father, the identity of her mother is unknown. She was presumably the daughter of Cleopatra VI Trifina, also known as Cleopatra V. Trifina, the cousin wife or sister wife of Ptolemy XII. Cleopatra Isaira was the only member of the Ptolemaic dynasty known for certain to have introduced some non Greek ancestry, being a descendant of Apama, the Sogdian Persian wife of Seleucus I. It is generally believed that the Ptolemies did not intermarry with native Egyptians. Michael Grant asserts that there is only one known Egyptian mistress of a Ptolemy and no known Egyptian wife of a Ptolemy further arguing that Cleopatra probably did not have any Egyptian ancestry and would have described herself as Greek. Stacey Schiff writes that Cleopatra was a Macedonian Greek with some Persian ancestry, arguing that it was rare for the Ptolemies to have an Egyptian mistress. Dwayne W. Roller speculates that Cleopatra could have been the daughter of a theoretical half-Macedonian Greek, half-Egyptian woman from Memphis in northern Egypt belonging to a family of priests dedicated to Top, a hypothesis not generally accepted in scholarship but contends that whatever Cleopatra's ancestry, she valued her Greek Ptolemaic heritage the most. Ernel Bradford writes that Cleopatra challenged Rome not as an Egyptian woman but as a civilized Greek. Claims that Cleopatra was an illegitimate child never appeared in Roman propaganda against her. Strabo was the only ancient historian who claimed that Ptolemy XII's children born after Berenice IV, including Cleopatra, were illegitimate. Cleopatra v. or VI was expelled from the court of Ptolemy XII in late 69 BC, a few months after the birth of Cleopatra, while Ptolemy XII's three younger children were all born during the absence of his wife. The high degree of inbreeding among the Ptolemies is also illustrated by Cleopatra's immediate ancestry, of which a reconstruction is shown below. The family tree given below also lists Cleopatra v. Ptolemy XII's wife, as a daughter of Ptolemy X Alexander I and Berenice III, which would make her a cousin of her husband, Ptolemy XII, but she could have been a daughter of Ptolemy IX Lathyros, which would have made her a sister wife of Ptolemy XII instead. The confused accounts in ancient primary sources have also led scholars to number Ptolemy XII's wife as either Cleopatra V or Cleopatra VI, the latter may have actually been a daughter of Ptolemy XII, and some use her as an indication that Cleopatra V had died in 69 BC rather than reappearing as a co-ruler with Berenice IV in 58 BC, during Ptolemy XII's exile in Rome. Amenorinas, a contemporary queen of Kush who fought a war against the Romans in Egypt and Nubia, modern Sudan. Cleopatra, Rome character, from the HBO slash BBC series featuring actress Lindsay Marshall. Cleopatra the Alchemist, a female Greek philosopher, author, and alchemist of Egypt during the 3rd century. Cleopatra's Barge, a 19th century U.S. yacht named after Cleopatra. Cleopatra's Needle, three different ancient Egyptian obelisks, London, New York City, Paris, named after Cleopatra, though none have any real connection to her. Zenobia, a queen of Palmyra claiming descent from Cleopatra VII who invaded Egypt in her war with Roman Emperor Aurelian. List of female hereditary rulers.